please welcome Sandra McCollum. Thank you. Oh, oh, yep. That's on. All right. Oh, I just love this church already. I just love your pastors. They just have such a Jesus heart, you know, heart for people. And I want to come to that family feud fiesta, man. That sounds good. That sounds good. Wish I lived here. I would. So, uh, yeah, just thank you so much for having me. You know, they had me based on someone else's recommendation, Joanna, who, you know, they know, but I mean, who does that, you know? So thank, thank you. Wow. But you know what? It was God that opened the door. It was God. That, I've learned that I don't have to push any doors open. Not under grace. You don't have to push any doors open. He opens all the doors he wants us to walk through. So it's awesome. So first, I've got three things I want to do. One thing I forgot to do in the first service, introduce my family. <laughs> this, they know me. I'm just like, you know, get into my message. So this is my wonderful husband, Steve. Of 26 years, stand up, babe. I mean, you gotta stand up because we gotta see how handsome you are. <laughs> 26 years, and you'll see how much he had to put up with off of me for the first 20 years. And then these are our 15 year old twin girls, Angel and Star. Come on. They, um, okay, so. They're twins, and they did have the same color hair until they turned 15, and they're like, that's it. We want to get our, can we get our hair colored for our birthday present so people will know who we are? <laughs> so they did that. I think that's funny. So they're, I just, I'm blessed that my family wants to come with me and do this. My husband has a job, and he takes vacation. He took Friday off and Monday off, and, um, you know, they want to do that. I'm not dragging them to do that, and I'm just so blessed by that, you know, that we can do this as a family. It really means a lot to me, so so that's the first thing I want to do. The second thing I want to do is um, just tell you about my book and read the chapter titles to my book, and then I've got good news for you. I mean, the books are out there, but five of you are going to get a free book because someone, last night I was at Victoria's Tea Room speaking there at a banquet, and someone, and she doesn't want me to tell you who she is, but someone bought 10 books for this these two services and asked me to give them away. So... They gave five away the first service, and they gave five away. But we're going to do that at the end, so after I, after I teach. And so I just want to tell you about it. My book is called I Tried Until I Almost Died, <laughs> From Anxiety and Frustration to Rest and Relaxation. So here are the chapter titles. I think it helps people to hear the chapter titles because it helps you know about my book. But you're going to know more when I tell my story. Okay, part one, Breaking Free. Chapter one, Prison Break. Finding Release from the Shackles of Endless Expectations. Chapter 2, When We Come to the End of Ourselves. How the promise of God's grace, how the promise of grace brings rest to our weary souls. I loved how you said it, Pastor Orlando. It's just our place. We just believe. We just rest in the finished work of the cross. I mean, it is just, it's so wonderful. I can't get over how uncomplicated it is. <laughs> Chapter 3. We've been looking at it all wrong. When we truly believe in grace, everything changes. And then part two is called Living Free. Chapter four is Trying Hard is Not the Answer. Trying Harder. The grace-led life gives us victory over sin. Chapter five, Are You Ready to Let God Love You? The grace-led life frees us from the weight of guilt. And this is my story of the things God delivered me from. But it's not just my story. It's I'm teaching in here how you can live and rest in peace as well. Chapter 6, nothing you do will change his love for you. The grace-led life releases us from the pressure to perform. Chapter 7, what we do matters less than whom we follow. The religious person would say, I don't know about that, <laughs> but it's true. What we do matters less than whom we follow because what we do comes out of whom we follow. <laughs> the grace-led life trades rules for a relationship. Chapter 8, leaving your worries behind. The grace-led life fills us with peace. Chapter 9, God's got you covered. The grace-led life pushes aside fear. I tell stories in here. I tell a story of my spider phobia that God delivered me from. <laughs> Chapter 10, let God do the heavy lifting. The grace-led life rises above trials and doubts. 
Chapter 11, People Are God's Priority. The grace-led life flows out of us in love for others. In Chapter 12, You Can't Argue With Results. Experience the exhilaration of the grace-filled life. So I'll go ahead and give this to you girls since I won't need any more and then we'll give five away at the end. Awesome. The, the, the next thing I want to say is um, Joanna actually came over to me during worship. She just said that the Holy Spirit had put something on her heart to tell me and that helped me to know that I need to teach the same message that I taught the last service. I was going to teach a different message, but I know that I'm supposed to teach that. It's called No Condemnation. And so that's what I'm going to do. I love the Spirit-led life. Oh, my goodness, I spent so many years living out of here. Well, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, I can't do that. I mean, I need to teach a different message. You know? But no, nope, no, nope. I'm supposed to teach that message, so that's good. And then the other thing I want to tell you is I feel like the Holy Spirit's put on my heart just to tell you if you're struggling with anything like a physical illness, um, mental anguish, which we always have, all have at times, um, um, or emotional wounds, that I just really feel like God's going to bring healing to you today. And I just want to encourage you to receive. And the thing is, is Jesus finished it all. He already provided everything you need for your physical healing, for emotional healing, to deliver you and help you with any mental anguish uh, or torment you're going through. And so it's not based on your works. Just keep that in mind as I'm ministering this message today, because I believe as you hear my story and how I was caught up into works and self-efforts and just living a crazy, crazy life because of it, that you're just going to relax. You're going to find, you know, different ones of you will find your place in different places in my story. And I just believe that as you just rest and know it's all because of Jesus, it's all because of what he did, that you're just going to receive healing. So, I just want to encourage you that with that just to receive. Yes, thank you, Lord. Okay, so the title of my message is called No Condemnation, and I'll start out with Romans 8, verse 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Let me go down here and read something to you. There is now... At this time, so now means at this time, currently, presently. No means by no means, not at all, under no circumstances. Condemnation for us because we have chosen to make Jesus our Lord and Savior. Okay? Now, I mean, I'm not talking about just when you have a good day. I'm talking about when you're having a bad day. There's no condemnation. So I just want to ask you. Is that your reality? Because if it's not, that's what God wants for you. He wants that for you. He wants you to get it so strong in your heart today that Jesus took all of the punishment upon himself for your sin and my sin that we don't have to be under condemnation because we're totally forgiven for all of our sin, all because of Jesus, because of the blood he shed. And so condemnation is something I lived under for 34 years. I became a Christian when I was eight years old, and I'll tell you my story in a minute. But I mean, I lived under so much guilt and condemnation, and that was not, that was not how God wanted me to live. And it was, it was just a torture, just torment. And I know that many, many Christians live under guilt and condemnation. And it's still something. I mean, I pretty much don't mess with guilt and condemnation anymore. And you'll know why when you hear my story. But there are still times when I'm tempted, tempted to come under, you know, feeling bad about myself, guilt, condemnation. And I have to remember that what God showed me in my grace journey, that one day he just showed me, you know, I... Jesus, I sent my son, Jesus, to die for you. And when you come under guilt and condemnation, you're basically saying, Jesus, you did a pretty good job, but not quite good enough. So I need to add in my own guilt and condemnation for what I just did. And, you know, just to kind of make it okay. Man, when I got that, I was like, I mean, it was a real holy moment for me. I really got it. It was like, oh, I'm so sorry, Jesus, because you paid the full price for anything that I did in the past, anything currently and future, past, present, and future sins, forgiven, wiped out, all because of Jesus. And when you, 
if a person doesn't understand true grace, which I believe you will, you probably already do because you go to this church, but uh, but for those, you know, new or, or visiting, if a person doesn't understand true grace, that can sound like sloppy living because oh, I don't know, you know, you can't just, you know, do whatever you want, and, but you won't want to. When you understand true grace, you don't want to because it changes your heart. And so it's the only way the Christian life works. Let me tell you my story. I was born again at the age of eight. I still remember being in uh, just in the living room floor, sitting in a circle with my mom and my brother and sister. I have two brothers, but the other one wasn't born yet. And uh, so I just remember being, you know, receiving Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Never forget that. And it just from the right from the very beginning, I loved Jesus so much. And I wanted to live the Christian life right. I wanted to please God. And I didn't know, and this was not because I was taught wrong. I just didn't. Maybe it was probably a lot of these things I can guarantee you were told to me, but it was here, but it didn't go to my heart. And I believe I just had a veil over my eyes, okay? And um, God's turning it all around for the good, like he always does, right? Romans 8, 28, because now I get to tell my story and, um, and help set other people free. But I just lived just working to be good, working to, like, look good in front of other people and also looking good before God because I saw God wrong. I had really deep misconceptions about him and I saw him as someone who was just standing over me waiting to beat me over the head every time I made a mistake. And so I was afraid of him. And uh, that is, it's really strong in my heart because of how, I mean, that messed me up royally (laughs) to believe that way about God. And uh, because of that, I really want to help. One of the things I want to do through, we want to do through our ministry is help people see God's true nature. Help people see that he's a good God. He's a loving God. He doesn't put things on you. He doesn't put anything bad on you, and he doesn't allow anything bad to come on you. That's He is a good God. And, and John 10.10 10 says, um, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance. So just remember, always remember, if it's good, it came from God. If it's bad, it came from the devil. And the good thing is, is when you, once you've received Christ as your savior, the devil does not have any authority over you. The only thing he's got is lies. He tries to get us to believe his lies. And that's what he did to me for so, so many years living as a Christian. So, so for 34 years, I struggled to live the Christian life. And I mean, I just, two, two sides of this. One side over here, spiritual maturity. I mean, I wanted to, I was always measuring myself, like constantly measuring myself. Okay, today I still have this anger problem and I need to get better in this, you know, and, and okay, I did that. I screamed at the girl and, and, you know, there's all kinds of different things. And I was always trying to improve myself. But the thing is, I didn't know this at the time. I mean, I really didn't know I was messed up. <laughs> I thought I was doing the Christian life correctly, but because I thought you were just supposed to try harder if you couldn't get better, you know? And so I just thought that, and, but I mean, it wasn't working. That's the problem. I mean, I finally came to the point 34 years after becoming a Christian where I was like, this is not working. (laughs) I mean, I am trying my head off to be this good person and this is not working. I keep failing. I keep feeling like a failure. So I had that side of it. And then I had the natural side of things where um, like the perfectionist, legalistic, I just wanted to get my list checked off every day. I had this long list that I would make every day. And I don't, if you're a list maker, it's okay. It's, lists aren't bad. But I mean, I was ridiculous with my list. I had, my family will tell you, I had so many things on the list, it would be impossible for anybody to get those things done. And so I would try, but I was a real bubbly, I'm a real bubbly person. And, and I wake up early. I'm a, I'm a uh, early person, you know, a, a morning person. <laughs> Actually, this morning, now that I'm under grace, I'm just so, so thankful god for what he's done in my life i mean like i'll never ever stop being thankful for the way that he's changed me and honestly i'm i'm really glad almost that i had the past years to look back to because every day i don't think the day goes by that i don't strike the difference between wow god look how you helped me react in that situation and how i used to would have been because now i'm living under your grace and it's him his life in me and through me instead of the life of christ me just resting and letting him live his life in and through me instead of me trying. But for 34 years, I was caught up in my self-effort. So that list 
what I would do is I would get up or, oh, I didn't tell you what happened this morning. So this morning, now that I'm under grace, I'm just like a little child. I'm just so thankful. And I mean, I got up, it was before four o'clock AM because I wanted to study a little bit before we came over. So I wanted to get ready first. My family was still sleeping and I was in the bathroom just like, boom. I'm your child, God, yeah. I was, I'm just like so happy to be a child of God because I had those misconceptions about him before and now I know how much he loves me and I receive his love every day. So I'm getting ahead of myself, but I couldn't help but telling that. And so, but before what I would do is I would get up and my whole goal was to get my list checked off every day, you know, grow spiritually from the spiritual side of things, get my list checked off. Because, and the reason I did that is because I, I didn't know how to get my worth and value out of anything else besides accomplishment. And so I felt like I'm a failure if I don't get all of this done. So I would live to do that um, every day, day in and day out for 34 years. But what would happen is I would fail almost every day. There, there would be one, now once in a while I would get that list checked off. And I remember I would, I would, let myself off what I'm going to tell you about my treadmill of accomplishment to celebrate for a few minutes, but then I'd have to get back on. So let me tell you about that. Every day I'd get up on what I call my treadmill of accomplishment and I would run, run, because I want to be worth something and I want to be valuable and I have to get this stuff done to feel that, to have that feeling. And so once in a while I would get my list checked off or I'd feel like I made this great leap spiritually, you know, in my own self-efforts. Well, it didn't last long, let me tell you, because <laughs> it never does if we're doing it in our own strength. But I felt like, you know, I got some kind of breakthrough. So I would let myself off the treadmill, but even then, only for a short time, because, you know, the momentum is going. And Sandra, you need to get back up on that treadmill because you need to keep going and keep the momentum to be a good Christian. And so, but most days I would feel like a failure at the end of every day. And I did not know I was blinded. I thought I was doing the Christian life the way it was supposed to be done. I thought I was just supposed to keep trying harder, but I knew inside, this isn't working. So I'd go, okay, what, what do, and, and I'm not against listening to podcasts. Actually, I listen to them all the time. But back then I was doing this all in my own strength. So, so keep that in mind. I listen to a podcast, like on love, say, because I want to be more loving. They're like, okay, this is the answer. Ra rah, rah. Now I'm going to put this into action. I wasn't depending on the grace of God, not one bit. I didn't even know what grace was at the time. And uh, I'm sure I'd been taught it, but it was here, but it wasn't here. And uh, so it was just all in Sandra McCullum's own self-efforts. Now, what I was doing was I was living under the old covenant of law instead of the new covenant of grace. But I didn't know that because I didn't know there were two covenants. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know that was an old and new covenant. And so I said uh, it, earlier, I said, we, there used to, I don't even think the church is still there anymore. But in St. Louis, there used to be a church called New Covenant. And we went there when we were little, but I didn't know I was living in the New Covenant when I went to New Covenant Church. <laughs> and so, but now I do, thank God. Um, he, he led me to the right things that first year of my grace journey. And we learned about the New Covenant. But back then I was living under the old covenant. So I do everything under the law. And here's the thing. The law is not bad. The law is holy, just, and good. And the law has got a very, very important purpose. But I didn't know what it was. I thought it was just like, I need to try to do it. Like, keep working harder so you can keep trying to do the law. And, um, you know, Ten Commandments, the 600 and whatever, any law that I made up in my mind, you know. But actually, God gave the law to help drive us to the end of ourselves so we could see we cannot do it. And we need a savior. And so even though I was saved, I was still, and I was under the new covenant. That was my reality, but I wasn't living it. So I just want to encourage you with, there can be a truth like the truth. I was under the new covenant, but if you don't either know about that truth, or if you don't believe that truth, it's not going to do you any good. Okay. And so I was living as if I was still under the old covenant of law. So I was just trying, trying, trying. And so I would get up on that treadmill, and then at the end of every day, um, not every day, but a lot of days, I would get real frustrated, and I, with my, like, at the end, I would go into a panic mode, what I call panic mode, because it was like, oh, no, I'm not going to get my list checked off, I'm not going to get my, I didn't, you know, say it out loud, but in my mind, I'm not going to get my list checked off, oh, no, and that meant to me, I'm a failure, I'm a failure, I'm a failure, I need to work harder, I need to work harder, 
And uh, so I would go, I would actually take it out on my family many times and be like, you know, Angel Star, you're leaving this stuff laying around the house. Pick this stuff up, you know. Come on, come on, come on. Steve, you know, I'd tell my husband, you're not giving me enough compliments. You need to compliment me more, you know. I did not. I was so <laughs> deceived and blinded that, yeah, they put up with a lot, let me tell you. But now, now it's like made up. The last six years have been so awesome, right? So now it's like totally made up. Come on, wave to him. And uh, really, my husband put up with a lot for 20 years. In fact, I'll go there. I'll tell you about that. Um, he did not know what to expect when he came in the door at night from work. I mean, because I was so all over the map emotionally because of this, what was going on inside me. I mean, my breathing pattern was even like, <laughs> because I was just so anxious and frustrated. I mean, that was my existence almost all the time. And uh, I, and I don't even remember, I even remember there would be short little times, like, I don't know, minutes that I would think, you love me so much. But it never, I, I, I just went right back into my works. And so I got a little taste, got a little taste of what I was going to go into. Not because it wasn't his will for me to get it right then, but I had to come to the end of myself first. And I'll talk to you about that. And so I actually ended up getting sick because, I mean, I did this for 34 years. I lived under this heavy load of stress for 34 years. And so I ended up getting sick. I really was sick many times throughout the years, but I ended up having what I call a two-year health nightmare at the end. I mean, at 2009 is when I get sick. It was about the end of 2009, November. I started growing a cyst. I remember I was at a restaurant with some ladies, and I had the worst pain that I had ever had up to that point, almost fainted, and they had to rush me to the hospital, and I had a cyst, and... Um, I'm going to stay on track here. And um, I had a cyst, and it grew to the size of a cantaloupe. And then I had to have a surgery for, the, surgery for that. And that surgery, the doctor accidentally did something wrong. You know, it, it, the cyst was so big, it was hard. I don't blame him. I've totally, I'm not holding that against him. But it did cause a lot of problems. And for two years, I had to have stents and nephrostomy too put in my back. And I had, you know, um, I had uh, uh, infections, high fevers, stuff like that. And so God got me through all that. But I believed at that time that God was doing that to me, that he put that on me because I had made some wrong choices. But I didn't know I was believing that. See, I didn't know any of this stuff at the time. I just thought I was believing. I, I, in fact, I was like, I'm believing God, you know. That's why I let the cysts grow to the size of a cantaloupe because I'm like, I'm believing God. I'm going to do some natural stuff and believe God, which is not wrong if you really feel that. But, but for me, it was I really wasn't believing God. So, um, so... I got through that, but I was worn out. At the end of 2011, I said to God, one day, right after Christmas, I can't do this anymore, God. I can't live the Christian life. It's not, it's not working. <laughs> and uh, so I really believe I was threatening to quit Christianity that day. But I also said, I need serious help. And he heard me. He hears us when we pray. And uh, when, when I said that, he heard me. And a week later, I was having my devotional time with God. That's another thing I did regularly, but I didn't do it out of devotion. I did it because I was afraid God would be mad at me if I didn't. And uh, so, see, because I saw him all wrong. That's why I want to really help people see that he's a good, good father. And uh, so, so I was having devotional time that morning, 5.30 a.m. in the morning, and I just felt like, well, no, I was, I was actually telling, uh, telling God, I was praying and saying, is there anything more you want me to accomplish this year? It was January 2nd of 2012, so New Year. And um, can you believe I even asked that? <laughs> but like I said, I was blinded, and I just felt in my heart that, no, there was nothing else he wanted me to accomplish for sure. But right about that time, I felt like the love of God just swept into the room like a tidal wave. I've never experienced anything like that but have not lost that knowing his love since then. And I mean, it was so strong and so powerful. And what he helped me just understand in my heart that day is, Sandra, I love you just because you're my daughter, not for anything you do for me. It's, I just love you because I want to, because you're my daughter, you're my child. And that changed me. That, that just struck me so profoundly, that revelation of his love for me, not according to my works, just because 
He wanted to love me just because I was his daughter. Then it changed me forever. But I didn't know what had happened that day. I didn't know this was going to be like like a big change. I just thought I went away from that time. I had typed some stuff in my Mac journal, and then I have that in my book because um, during that devotional time that I felt like he was showing me. And uh, But I just thought, wow, this is a great devotional time. Wow, you know, good. And uh, But the next morning I woke up, and I couldn't find my treadmill of accomplishment. I didn't, I did not have the desire, like I totally lost the desire to get on that treadmill and run for my worth and value. It was gone. I couldn't even find it. And I had this peace that passed, just, you know, the peace the Bible talks about that passes all understanding. I kept reacting like the four situations, most all of them, you know, anything that went wrong would freak me out. And uh, any, anything I did wrong, other circumstances. And so I lived that way so long. I mean, it was a huge change. It was like, how am I reacting like this? I'm like so peaceful. This happened and I'm, I'm not freaking out. And so I didn't say anything to anybody, um, to my family or anybody for like 30 days. Um, well, it was January 2nd. And then on January 28th, I remember writing in my Mac journal because this kept, I kept feeling this peace. And uh, on January 2nd, I mean, on January 28th, I wrote in my Mac journal, well, God, it's very obvious to me. You did something to me on January 2nd. You have you have helped me. You have made a change in me. And I didn't know at the time, but it was a revelation of his love for me that he gave me. And then he set me on a journey to understand the riches of his grace. And so I, I, about the end of that month, sometime I got my family together and I said, God's done something in me. I'm different. I knew if I didn't talk to him soon, they were going to wonder what was wrong with me because I was so different, you know? And um, so I was crying and I just really apologized to them because like with my girls and Steve, You know, I made them feel like you're just coming up a little bit short all the time. You know, that's hard. That's 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 painful. That's why I say if you've experienced that from a parent or from someone, I just believe God's going to begin just to heal you emotionally today. I've had many people tell me they've read my book and received emotional healing from it, you know, cried and cried. And um the reason I was treating them that way is because I thought that's how God was treating me. I had the wrong belief that he was, that he was standing over me waiting for me to make a mistake and just going to bang me over the head when I did. So when God helped me see his true nature, when he opened up my eyes, the veil fell off. When he opened up my eyes, then I was like, I saw what I was doing and I saw how I was treating my family, apologized to them. We just believe, you know, we just talked about how we wanted things to be going forward. And of course, this has been a journey of God helping me, helping unravel my wrong believing and, um, and unspool my wrong believing and help me form right beliefs. It's, and it'll continue to be a journey till Jesus comes back, you know, it's, but it's the best journey of my life. Oh my goodness. Because now I realize it's all about Jesus. I thought it was all those years, what I thought was it was about what I needed to do for him, but for G, for God. But now I realize it's all about what Jesus did for me. Okay, what God did for me, giving his son. And because I live from that place now, I can't stop wanting to do things for God. But it's, it's comes, it's effortless because grace changes our heart. So it's not like, and then he's just changing me. I mean, I don't. Hardly ever struggle with a bad temper anymore. I'm not going to say I never get upset, but, but I mean, I do not hardly, but it's because I receive his grace that I've been learning about. And I talk about it in my book. I've been receiving it now for six years on the good days and on the bad days. (laughs) And that's so important because, you know, sometimes grace is understood like a theology, like a, a doctrine. But really, grace is the person of Jesus Christ. He is God's grace personified. And when we understand that he is grace and we receive him as the person of grace and our faith begins to be placed in him and in in his grace, you know, in God's grace, which is Jesus, instead of in our own efforts, oh, my goodness, I began to see miracle after miracle after miracle, including in my schedule. Because I could never, like, I always felt like I can't get life right. I got to get organized. I got to get, you know, and, and I felt like, you know, I had that list mile long. Now 
you guys, I get my list done. If I have a list, I get my list done and I get so much more done by his grace. I mean, it's really, I I just continue to be astounded by what he does. Now, it doesn't mean I never feel overwhelmed. You know, doesn't mean I'm perfect. That's what I'm saying. When I do, I continue to receive his grace and not come under guilt and condemnation. So I'm going to go through these scriptures real fast because I want to finish in five minutes. So Romans 2, Romans 2. No, let's start with Romans 1. Romans 8, 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. Woo! He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and go to Romans uh, 8 verse 5. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Now, I want to say one thing. Before, I would read the Bible regularly, but I didn't read it correctly. I read it through the Old Covenant lens, you know, through an Old Covenant lens, Old Covenant of Law, instead of New Covenant of Grace. So now I have grace glasses. <laughs> I don't really put these on every time I read the Bible. This is to make a point. But you have to read the Bible through the lens of grace. Because if you read it through the finished work of the cross, it looks, it, you read it totally different. Let me explain. So like verse 5 before, so again it says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So I would say stuff like this, because I wasn't, I wasn't reading with my grace glasses on. Oh my gosh, I'm sure I'm dominated by the, my sinful nature. After all, I feel like I am constantly messing up. I'm going to try harder to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, though. The, try harder, right? That works. That not. <laughs> That's all I need to do is just try harder. Okay, next verse, verse 6. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So I would think of this. Okay, I can do it. I'm going to let the spirit control my mind more often. Ra, ra, ra. I was like a cheerleader on the inside part of the time when I was doing good, and I felt like a failure the other part of the time when I was doing bad. You know what that is? That's living by your own self-righteousness. I mean, it really is. When it's get, it's it's living under the old covenant. Get you do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. And I was so like I was all over the map emotionally because I was doing that all the time. Oh, I wasn't supposed to do that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I was I was I was just vacillated back and forth all the time. My emotions because of my believing. It all went back to how I was believing. See, and so verse eight. Uh, yeah. No, I, I read verse eight right. Let me read verse, uh, okay, verse 7. Thank you. You helped me. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. Verse 8. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. And then I would think, that's right, Sandra. You've got to stop blowing it, or you're never going to be pleasing to God. That's how I saw the Bible before. But now I see it through the lens of grace. Okay? I got to show you. This is just to make a point. Always read your Bible through your... I got these on Amazon the other day. <laughs> Always read your Bible through your grace glasses, through the lens of grace. You know, it's important. So Romans 8, 9 says, but you... I never saw this before because I didn't see the Bible through the lens of grace. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. Wait, there's more good news. Romans 8, 11 says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living in you. So I'm going to stop there and just say, 
I didn't see that before. I didn't know who I was. I was really, what I was doing is I was seeing myself and identifying with myself as a sinner. Before, what I was before Christ. But I was really righteous because he's given us a gift of righteousness that is not according to our works. It's according to what Jesus did on the cross. But us receiving that helps us to do more good works. I mean, like it helps us be more obedient. It helps us live a holy, holier lifestyle. It's all by receiving what he did for us. And then that effortlessly produces fruit. The Holy Spirit produces the fruit in and through us that we need to, you know, to live. Because it is important how we live. But we can't do it on our own. And that's what I was trying to do. So I was identifying as a sinner instead of identifying as someone righteous. So I encourage you to get up every morning and remember all throughout the day, you are right now, no matter what you're struggling with, young people, <laughs> you are right now the righteousness of God in Christ. That is who you are. And it is so important to remember that on your good days and your bad days. Because if you don't, then you're going back to self-righteousness. Because then you're saying, well, I'm only going to receive his grace. His, I would say his gift of righteousness is part of his grace to me. That's what I would say. So I'm, I'm only receiving his grace and his righteousness, his gift of righteousness on the days I'm good. But that's not grace. Because grace is his unmerited favor. So if we're doing that, we're really going back to trying to do it in our own self. We have to receive it. And believe it. And when we do, his grace changes our heart and we will see. I mean, my spiritual life has taken off like a rocket. I mean, I'm just like, I keep saying, well, oh, help me in that area, God. And I can't stop being thankful to him. And I don't even want to take the credit because I know how many years I tried to live and failed. Okay. It's all because of Jesus and what he's done. And I know you already know that because you go to this church, but I just want to encourage you to keep focusing on Jesus. And you struggle, and this is what I tell my, you know, sometimes I have friends that text me, ask for help in the area of grace. I'll say, and they'll be like, had a bad day or had a fight with their husband. And I'll say, you, he wants you to focus right back on him and remember what he's done for you. And believe me, repentance isn't even an issue. You don't, I mean, repentance is going to come naturally because it's God's goodness that leads us to repentance. So when you have your eyes on Jesus, you are going to live a repentant lifestyle, and repentance means to change your mind. And believe me, you're going to be changing your mind when you have your eyes on Jesus and what he's done for you, as opposed to always thinking, what I need to do for him, what I need to do for him. That's going to come naturally. It's not about rules, remember. It's about relationship. I only went two, two minutes over. Is that okay? <laughs> no, that's good. I believe I've given you everything the Holy Spirit wanted me to give you. But I do want to respect the time frame. And believe me, you don't know what a miracle it is. I've done these teachings in that short of a time. That is totally God. He is so good. And I'll never stop thanking him for what he's done in my life. I truly feel like I've been born again all over again. I really do. And now I just want to spend the rest of my life telling people the good news. And uh, that's what's going to happen to you when you get this. And, and many of you, like I said, already have it. And I'm just one more little seed planted in your heart here. You know, I'm just getting to plant a seed in your heart. But you do. You just think, this is a totally different life. My husband and I didn't realize how much we had complicated Christianity. When we got a hold of this, we're like, you've got to be kidding. It's all we have to do is believe and rest in the finished work of the cross, and he does everything else in and through us, you've got to be kidding. And you feel like you're doing something wrong, right? Like you're going to get in trouble? Yeah, we did. We went through that. But then we finally decided, nope, we're jumping off the cliff into the ocean of God's grace, and we are going to stay in there for the rest of our lives. We're going to stay under that waterfall of his grace. No matter what we're doing, no matter if we're having a good day or a bad day, and guess what? We have a lot more good days than bad days now. It's because we're living under his grace. And all we can do when that happens is say, thank you, God. You're the one that changes us. God bless you. Mm -hmm.